Come, you blessed of my Father, receive the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Alleluia. Alleluia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Brothers and sisters, today the church celebrates the feast days of Saints Nereus and Achilles, who were martyrs in the early church. Uh, according to tradition, they were martyred near the end of the first century. Uh, they were both brothers, and uh, they served in the Roman military, then left the military life uh, to follow Christ. And it's said that they were baptized by St. Peter himself. And so then they would end up being martyred for their faith. Um, and so we ask for their intercession for us today. In a special way, we also want to pray for all those who serve in the military. As we prepare to celebrate these holy and sacred mysteries, let us call to mind our sins and ask the Lord for his pardon and his peace. I confess to, to Almighty, Almighty God and, and to you, my, my brothers, brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask the Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Christe eleison. Christe eleison. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Let us pray. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that we who know the great courage of the glorious martyrs Nereus and Achilles in confessing you may experience their loving intercession for us in your presence. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. In those days, some Jews from Antioch and Iconium arrived and won over the crowds. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered around him, he got up and entered the city. On the following day, he left with Barnabas for Derbe. After they had proclaimed the good news to that city and made a considerable number of disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch. They strengthened the spirits of the disciples and exhorted them to persevere in faith, saying, It is necessary for us to undergo many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. They appointed presbyters for them in each church and with prayer and fasting commended them to the Lord in whom they had put their faith. Then they traveled through Pisidia and reached Pamphylia. After proclaiming the word at Perga, they went down to Attilia. From there, they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had now accomplished. And when they arrived, they called the church together and reported what God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Then they spent no little time with the disciples. The word of the Lord. Your friends make known, O Lord, the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your, your friends, friends make, make known, known, O Lord, Lord the, the glorious, glorious splendor, splendor of your of kingdom. kingdom. Let all your works give you thanks, O Lord, and yet let your faithful ones bless you. Let them discourse of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might. Your, your friends, friends make, make known, known, O Lord, Lord the, the glorious, glorious splendor of your kingdom making known to men your might and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is a kingdom for all ages, and your dominion endures through all generations. Let your, your, your friends, friends make, make known, known, O Lord, Lord the, the glorious, glorious splendor, splendor of your kingdom. kingdom. May my mouth speak the praise of the Lord, and may all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Your, your friends, friends make, make known, known, O Lord, Lord the, the glorious, glorious splendor of your kingdom. kingdom.
Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ had to suffer and to rise from the dead, and so enter into his glory. Alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. You heard me tell you, I am going away and I will come back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it happens, so that when it happens you may believe. I will no longer speak much with you, for the ruler of the world is coming. He has no power over me, but the world must know that I love the Father, and that I do just as the Father has commanded me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, it's providential that we had our uh, martyrs for today that we're celebrating today fall uh, during these readings because uh, there's a theme of suffering really throughout all the readings and in uh, the martyrs that we're celebrating, who gave, again, Saints Nereus and Achilles, who gave their lives for Christ. Um, rather than to deny him. Um, but we see uh, this theme of suffering, especially in the Acts of the Apostles, in our, well, actually, the reading today and then yesterday's reading. So uh, this, these were the first couple lines from uh, yesterday's first reading, so just to, to call that to mind. It says, There is an attempt in Iconium by both the Gentiles and the Jews, together with their leaders, to attack and stone Paul and Barnabas. They realized it and then fled to the Lycaonian cities of Lystra and Derbe. So today, the crowds are successful because it says in those days, some Jews from Antioch and Iconium arrived and won over the crowds. They stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. And the crowds presumably leave. The disciples gather around him, and he gets up and goes right back into the city, back to where they were persecuting him. And so there's something that's almost, I mean, it's almost kind of a, humorous in a way, in that Luke just takes a couple of lines to describe what happens. When we really think about the sufferings that Paul went through, so this is the second attempt they made at stoning. They're successful this time. Apparently the crowds thought they did a good enough job because they stoned him to the point where he wasn't moving or they thought he was dead, so they drag him, they throw him out of the city. Um, and then Paul gets up, uh, again, miraculously it would seem, uh, through God's grace, and then uh, enters the city again um, and continues to preach. And then as they're strengthening the disciples and continuing to preach, they would have, the disciples presumably would have seen the effects of the stoning on Paul's face on his body, and perhaps they were a little shocked or stunned or dismayed at, at seeing the suffering. And so he says, it's necessary for us to undergo many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And my, brother, my brothers and sisters, this is a really important point, right? That we accept suffering when it comes to us because when we, we unite it with Christ's sufferings, it's, incredible, it's incredibly powerful. It can bring an incredible amount of grace into the world. Grace is that we won't see, um, sometimes we can see them, but most of the time we won't see them until, uh, you know, after, beyond, beyond this life, um, in the next life. And so it's so important to offer those sufferings in union with Christ. We don't seek the sufferings out for their own sake. Right? So the first time that there is an attempt by the Jews to stone uh, Paul and Barnabas, they flee from it. Right? They're not trying to get themselves in a situation where they're stoned. And yet when that uh, comes, when that suffering comes, it's accepted and it doesn't deter them from preaching the gospel. Um, and, you know, when we read stories about this or the stories of the martyrs that suffered in incredible ways, we think, oh, my gosh, I don't think I could do that. Um, and none of us could, right? Even the saints and the martyrs can. It's through the grace of God, right? God will never, uh, he'll never ask us to do something. He's not willing to give us the grace to endure. And we, we see Jesus expressing that in our gospel where, again, this is on uh, Holy Thursday, so on the eve of when he's going to enter into his passion, and Jesus knows the suffering that's going to come to him, but he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. And that's, those are some incredibly powerful words for Jesus to speak, knowing the suffering that he's going to undergo, nor knowing how difficult it's going to be for the disciples to see his suffering. And yet he's telling them to not let their hearts be troubled or afraid. 
it's a tall order. It's difficult. Um, we just think about the sufferings that we're all undergoing um, during this time of quarantine, the inconveniences, the hardships of kind of being locked down, all of those things, the annoyances of the people around us sometimes, maybe family members or, or friends. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of suffering, even if it's not, even if it's uh, for some of us, it maybe is uh, life and death. For others, maybe the suffering isn't to that point. But no matter how large or how small the suffering is, that it can be offered in union with Christ. And that Christ himself promises to give us the strength to endure it. Because he says that if we want it, he will give us his peace. A peace that doesn't come from the world. Right? So it's not found in any government or society or political party. It is found in Christ. And that's a peace that only he can give. And that is a peace that will help us to endure any suffering that comes our way. Trusting in our Heavenly Father's love and mercy for us, we now present to him our prayers and our needs. For the church, the people of God, may the Lord continue to strengthen us in faith and charity. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our civic leaders, may wisdom and justice guide them in their work for the common good. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who face chronic illness or pain, may the Lord strengthen and encourage them in their trials. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our faith community, may all our hearts be filled with the peace only Christ can offer. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the faithful departed, for lives lost to the coronavirus, and for all Holy Family parishioners who died on this date, including... Joseph Pescatello and Marie Sollingsberger. May they come to enjoy the, re the reward of eternal life in heaven. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for the repose of the soul of Carl Rozier, for whom this Mass is being offered. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great love and peace you grant us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we ask you to please hear and answer these prayers and all the prayers we hold in our hearts. They are all made to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. 
May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all of his holy church. In honor of the precious death of your just ones, O Lord, we come to offer that sacrifice from which all martyrdom draws its origin, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation. Always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For you are glorified when your saints are praised. Their very sufferings are but wonders of your might. In your mercy you give ardor to their faith. To their endurance you grant firm resolve. And in their struggle the victory is yours through Christ our Lord. Therefore, all creatures of heaven and earth sing a new song in adoration, and we with all the host of angels cry out, and without end, we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Save us, Savior, Savior of, of the world. world. For, For by your cross and resurrection, you have set us, us free. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, 
Grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with saints Nereus and Achilles, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Earl, our Bishop, Carl, our Bishop Emeritus, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. On your stay, we totally spectate moni, misere on this Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord I, am I am not worthy that you should, should enter under my roof, but, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
To the victor I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of my God. Alleluia. Alleluia. And as one body in Christ, let us pray together our spiritual communion prayer. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in this most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you are already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray. As we celebrate by this divine banquet, the heavenly victory of the blessed martyrs Nereus and Achilles, we beseech you, Lord, to bestow victory on those who eat here below of the bread of life and to allow them to eat as victors from the tree of life in paradise. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to you. God. St. Michael, the, the archangel, archangel, defend, defend us, us in battle. battle. Be our, our protection against, against the wickedness and snares of the devil. devil. May God, God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell, hell Satan, and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saints Nereus and Achilles, pray for us.
All right, good morning, everyone. Here to take your uh, questions today, if you have any. You can go ahead and submit them in on the live stream. And um, just uh, one quick thing before we get started into the questions here. Just want to make sure I've got my dates right. Um, oh, yeah, so uh, today, tomorrow, would be a great time to, if maybe some families, maybe you already do this together, but it would be a great time to uh, do it if you don't, uh, to pray the rosary. So tomorrow's Our Lady of Fatima. Um, the hundred and third anniversary, I believe. Uh, yeah, because um, it was, yeah, 1917. So, yeah, three years. Hundred uh, and third anniversary of Our Lady's apparitions at Fatima, where she, uh, well, encouraged is kind of a nice way of putting it. She was uh, very insistent that we would be praying the rosary um, <clears throat> for the conversion of sinners and for peace. So, that would be an especially good thing to do. And if you're already used to praying the rosary, um, daily uh, that's uh, maybe uh, to offer it up specifically for and reparation for sins and for peace throughout the world. So, um, yeah, Our Lady of Fatima is tomorrow. So and I'm sure Father Joe will. Well, I shouldn't presume. For, I'm assuming he would talk about it tomorrow. So. <laughs> uh, that's right, exactly. Every, every, everyone will be disappointed now if he doesn't. Um, but good, let's, uh, let me, let's get into some of the questions here. There we go. Okay. Uh, Father Peter, what is the significance of using bells during the liturgy of the Eucharist? Oh, yeah. Good question. Um, so that's one of the things that it, kind of, a, I think, a different, a little bit different, but a similar thing would be uh, incense. Um, like, why do we, so why do we use bells and incense during a Mass? Um, so you, I, well, I would say because if, if we don't, one of our staff members will get really angry if we don't use the bells. I'm <laughs> just joking. So that's that's me. that's my fault. No, um, we're uh, no we we use the bells and uh, incense and different things like that as a way to help us enter more deeply into worship. Um, so the bells uh, kind of serve a um, uh, they serve a, I mean as most things do or at least did at one point in the liturgy uh, history of the liturgy they serve a practical as well as a, a spiritual significance um, for I mean with the bells especially it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, it, it's obviously loud. It kind of wakes us up, right? And they're rung right at the moment of the epiclesis. Uh, so that's when the, the priest is uh, calling down the Holy Spirit and also at the elevation where the priest uh, holds up the host and the chalice. Um, and so it's to call to mind uh, what's going on, right? What's, uh, what's going on at that moment uh, for us to be attentive if, if our minds have drifted during Mass. And I know that would never, ever happen to anyone at Mass, and especially never, no one watching a live stream, right? And definitely would never happen for a priest, right? So, never. No, no. So, going, right. Yeah, yeah, or my Mass. I mean, you can get distracted Father Joe's Masses, but please, I mean, we're talking about quality of Masses here. I don't know if it, I don't know if it gets much better. No. Um, yes, we all get distracted, right? Our minds drift, um, our, you know, and certainly it happens when we're present physically at Mass. Um, I, yeah, God bless all of you that are tuning in for the live stream mass, because I'm sure it's awful in terms of, not, aw it's a good thing, obviously, but awful in terms of the attention and the distractions that are more prevalent, right, when we're watching through a screen, um, that's just, that's just harder, and so, um, yeah, maybe the bells are better <laughs> through the live stream, but it's, it's there to call our, our attention to mind, oh, bells are also a joyous sound, too, so I think that that's an element we could say is that, um, you know, we're obviously in the, we believe we're in the midst of the angels and the saints, that it's really a meeting of heaven to earth when the Eucharist is made present on the altar. And so the bells are a joyful sound as well. So it's calling that joy uh, and that, um, uh, that, uh, that moment of, of communion of, of the Lord coming to us. Um, so that, that would be another, I think, another a good reason as well. Um, you know, incense is a similar thing. Um, you know, that's, uh, and again, these are all optional things, right? So if you go to a place where they don't have the bells or they don't use incense, it's not like, the mass isn't valid or isn't real or anything. It, they're all they're all optional things. Um, I think they all you know, they can add to it, um, but, uh, but yeah, they're not they're not essential aspects of mass. I think they're great things if, if you're able to have them and we can add them into mass. Um, that and you know same thing with incense. It you know has that symbol. It symbolizes um, you know the prayers of uh, God's people rising up, going going up to God. Um, it also has one that one that I had heard a few years ago, which I hadn't thought of before. I always kind of heard the, the incense is representing um, God's or the, the prayers of God's people going up to Him in heaven, um, which is comes right out of the Book of Revelation. Um, but another, uh, this is from Bishop Robert Barron. I remember he talked about it, and I thought this was a good way of, of looking at it too. He said, with uh, incense, it also 
Um, since it's cloudy and smoky, right, well, what does it do? It obscures, right? It kind of obscures your sight. You're not able to see clearly. And it's a good spiritual lesson that we don't understand completely what's going on at the altar. I mean, we know it by faith. We know that Jesus is coming down, that he's being made present, um, you know, through, uh, you know, the bread and wine are transformed into his body, blood, soul, and divinity. But it's a mystery ultimately, right? And so we can have a greater and greater understanding of it. It doesn't obscure our sight completely, right? And so that's the beautiful thing about our faith. We can know more and more about it, but we never, we can never comprehend God completely. Otherwise, we would be God, and we're, we're obviously not. Um, so that was another, you know, kind of interesting symbolism of the incense that I hadn't thought about, that uh, incense kind of obscures our vision and doesn't make it clear. And it's a, it's a representation that God is ultimately mysterious, right? That we, um, and, and that uh, we're called to enter into that mystery. And uh, yeah, so that, that's a, uh, you know, that's another great, uh, there's a lot of beautiful, you know, symbolism and uh, spiritual imagery. Um, also, too, one of the more practical things, um, I think this came from an older time, not as, uh, maybe not quite as spiritually beautiful, but uh, back before modern hygiene, you'd have a lot of pilgrims come into these uh, churches and people come to these children. It didn't smell all that nice, so incense smells nice, and so it's a way of uh, making uh, otherwise stinky church smell nice, too. So that's, so again, practical, spiritual significance and uses, um, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, one of the, one of the, actually, while we're on little liturgical things, um, and yeah, I'm sorry, you asked about bells, and I'm going off on different tangents here, um, but the, uh, so the pall, and I think someone asked about this maybe like a few weeks or even a month ago, the pall is just kind of that square, um, uh, square thing that goes over the top. And again, that's some priests use that, some priests don't. Um, it's kind of a nice thing kind of showing the, um, oh, here we go. We have a show and tell right here. So this is this is the pall right here. So this is the square thing that just lays on top of the chalice um, after the uh, before the consecration and after the consecration. Um, and actually, one of the practical uses for it, and actually, it's I found it has a practical use still, um, depending on what time of the year it is. It was actually kind of a. Uh, uh, a fly catcher or fly preventer, you could say. So obviously after the consecration, you don't want flies or bugs getting into the chalice and getting into Jesus. And so uh, you would use this to place it over the chalice and to prevent anything from, uh, from falling into the chalice after the consecration especially. Uh, and it still serves that purpose. Sometimes if I've done like an outdoor mass or sometimes even in churches, if the windows are open and you know, it's, it's kind of spring, summer, you do have some bugs flying around. So I, I have found it to still serve its practical purpose. So it's a little bit of uh, a little bit of trivia there. So sorry, I should get back to more questions here. That was kind of a long, long tangent. Um, okay. Oh, okay. This is a good question. Um, did the Blessed Mother give us the Rosary as we say it? Um, no. That's uh, that. I want, I want to say no. There wasn't a particular like revelation of our blessed mother um now like the one i was just talking about our lady fatima she encouraged us to um pray the rosary um i'm going to be a little bit fuzzy on this but i, I think the way i want to say the way it, it started to occur um i want to say it started around the, the rosary in its form that we have now maybe around the late middle ages uh, maybe a little bit before but it basically came from the idea that um so one of the things that religious orders did so monks and nuns is, and some of them still do this, they would pray through all 150 psalms every week called the Liturgy of the Hours. So the priests pray what's called the breviary, and the breviary is abbreviated. So we, we pray a good chunk of those, but we don't pray all you know 150. We pray a good portion of them or parts of the different psalms. Uh, but the religious orders, uh, again, the more and strict ones, they would pray, and some of them still do, they'll pray seven times a day. There's seven different hours um, that they, uh, they pray. And so... Um, the rosary actually came about as a way of um, for the lay people to pray a ab abbreviated form of that because uh, with the three different mysteries and then five decades, so it ended up to 150. And so it was kind of a way for uh, lay people to uh, pray, you know, all 150 psalms sort of um, with, uh, with our Blessed Mother and meditating on the different mysteries of the rosary. And so that's kind of how it developed. Um, and uh, that's my understanding. And I, I can't remember like a specific saint or like a specific revelation where it was like, you know, we didn't have the rosary in its current form and now it is. I think it just kind of developed over time um, into the form we have now. Um, and uh, and, and it's, a, it's a devotional, right? It's a private devotion. So it's not like, um, it's not like the church would have, you know, 
come in and said, like, this is how you must pray the rosary. It, it's, uh, and even now, and that's the thing I, I joke about with people, is if you're praying the rosary with a group of people, you, sometimes you're not really sure <laughs> when it's going to end because some people add different prayers at the end or have extra prayers for this or that because it's a private devotion, and that's, that's okay, and that's good. Um, so, yeah, there wasn't, like, a specific revelation, but it kind of grew out of that, you know, the lay people wanting to pray the 150 psalms uh, along with the... Uh, the monks and nuns, and obviously, you know, uh, lay people not, uh, you know, still being in the world, uh, having an abbreviated form of that. So, yeah, that's kind of where, I'm sure there's more information that there is to that, but that's, that's what I can think of off the top of my head. Um, okay, let's see here. Hi, Father Peter. Awesome scarlet vestments. Well, thank you. Uh, after you personally take communion, you pause. Do you have an internal prayer, you say? I really like the spiritual communion prayer because it helps me keep focused on the moment. Um, oh, okay, and then someone else asked right after that, why are you wearing red instead of white today in this Easter season? Um, someone came in late on the live stream because I explained it. <laughs> no, 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 I'm joking. I, I, I can't see. Again, I, I, right, I just, I get the questions. I don't see the name, so I don't know who, <laughs> I don't know who it was. No, no, uh, we, wear, we, wear, we wear red for the martyrs, so uh, that's why um, we're celebrating uh, Saints Nereus and Achilles today, so uh, we're celebrating, we always wear red um, when we're celebrating martyrs. And actually, it wasn't, um, I could have worn white today because it's what's called an optional uh, feast day, so actually, there was Saints Nereus and Achilles uh, we also, there was St. Uh, Pancras, um, who was another martyr. Uh, actually, I think there's only 14 when he was martyred. Um, and then he could have actually celebrated the Easter, uh, the Easter day today. Um, so the, sometimes priests have those options. You have those different options to uh, celebrate. Um, and I, I always enjoy celebrating the martyrs if I have the option to. I think it's always a, a witness of, you know, um, you know, putting our sufferings in perspective and giving us that extra uh, motivation to unite them with Christ. Um, so that's why we're uh, wearing the red. And, and I, I like wearing red, too. So it's, a, and it's an excuse to break up the Groundhog Day of everything's the same. So that's another... No, no, that's not the main reason, but uh, it's really about the martyrs. But it's a nice side benefit. Um, that's right. That's right. Um, but yeah, getting back to the uh, communion, uh, communion prayer. Um, yeah, so after I receive communion, um, yeah, it's mostly just for me personally. It's just to, uh, to take some time to um, realize what's, what's going on, that this is the uh, most important moment of my life. I mean, really, truly, um, God's, you know, God's coming to me, uh, and I'm receiving him physically. And um, for me, as we were talking about distractions and things, it's really easy for me to get distracted, like, interiorly. So um, I just, I found for me, it helps me to take extra pauses and just, it forces me to stop. And because I think with any of us, and for priests, again, I can speak for myself, but I think if you talk with most priests, um, they would back me up on this. When you do the same thing over and over again, it's, it's really hard for it not to just become automatic and force of habit. Um, like with the mass, I mean, it's, the, it's a lot of times the same words, the same gestures, so it really is easy for it to like, you know, just kind of be a habit. Um, and so part of that, I mean, is good in the sense that you get used to it and it's not like you don't have to figure it out each time. But the other hard part of that then too is, you know, how not to, um, you don't want to take the Lord for granted or these, you know, these, uh, these sacred mysteries, again, that we say at the beginning of mass that we're celebrating. Um, so for me personally, taking some, moment, some extra time at the uh, elevation, at the consecration, right after I've received Holy Communion, um, it helps me to stop, to put the brakes on and just and realize what's, what's truly going on. So um, sometimes there might be like a, a, a prayer that I'm, I'm praying, you know, interiorly, like just asking Jesus to be with me, asking um, his grace to be with me, uh, you know, but more it's just trying to enter into and be present to the Lord at that moment and just, just being in awe of the mystery of what's going on. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, uh, that's, that's why I do that. Um, and again, different priests might do different things at that time and uh, other priests certainly might not be as easily distracted as I am. So that, I found that's, uh, that's helpful for me. Um, do you have church bells ringing outside? We do. We have ours. They don't, they go off, um, is it all day? Okay, 6, 12, 3, and 6. Uh, so, well, they go off at 6 in the morning, right? Okay. I never hear them because I'm never awake at that, that early in the morning. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a heavy sleeper, and uh, yeah, I, well, so, so 6, 12, 3, and 6, so that we go off uh, 
four four times. Um, yeah, so we do have them outside. And our, our even, even with the construction. Yeah, even with the construction. No, they're not, still plugged in. This is a qu okay, but there are. This is a question I have. Are they are they real bells, or do we have them hooked up on the sound system? Because it looks. Well, there is a bell system, and that rings up in the tower. Okay, so. but it's automatic. But it's a real bell that it's ringing. Because I've always wondered that. It's a light button. Oh, okay. Well, it sounds great. There's no. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, well, yeah, it sounds great, though. So I've always just kind of wondered, because I've noticed the, the, the things you learn every day. So. <laughs> um, oh, uh, someone asked how Father Ryan was doing. Um, he's doing well. Last time I had checked, I don't know if he's, he might still be in the ICU. We keep praying for him. Um, he, uh, he did send an update that he had been, he had had the, Oh boy, the remdesivir or something like that, uh, which is I guess one of the you know drugs they're trying out for uh, COVID. And he hadn't had a fever for over 24 hours, which was good. Um, and that he, uh, but he still had. I think they said they still had seen some pneumonia in his lungs. Um, so you know, keep praying for that. But he hadn't uh, before. You know, he had had like a fever of like 103 in temperature, and he hasn't had one for uh, last I checked over 24 hours. So that's good. Um, so it sounds like things are going well. But uh, continue to pray for him. It seems like he's doing uh, he's doing good and in, in good spirits. So um, yeah, I was I was joking around with him, and I, I sent him a text, and I said, "Well, you got what you wanted. It's all about you. You got all these thousands of people praying for you. It's been shared like a thousands of times on on Facebook and everything." <laughs> Just, I just give him a little bit of a hard time, but uh, no, please, thank you so much. I know he really appreciates it. Uh, he's very touched by all of the uh, prayers and comments and everything. So please, uh, please keep up your prayers for him as well. Um, okay. Do, okay. Let's see here. Our kids do a mini processional at the start of Mass with candles, Bible, and cross. What do you think of ringing a bell before Mass? For us, this would allow our procession to start without being without being too far behind your magical appearance on screen. Well, my appearances on screen are always magical, so thank you. <laughs> uh, no, I think, I, think that's, uh, I think that's great. I think any, um, anything that you're able to... We don't have what they call sanctuary bells, I think. Right. Right. They're asking if we could ring a bell. Oh, oh, okay. I, sorry, I, I was misunderstanding the question. Thank you for catching that. Um, they're asking, yeah, so we don't have any bells here in the sanctuary, so we don't, um, yeah, so I guess we don't have that. I was reading it as if you had bells at home and you were thinking about doing it. I was going to say, well, and if you are, go for it. Like, that would be great. I think anything, um, yeah, we, we don't have them here, but anything you, uh, yeah, anything you have um, to help enter into, you know, as much as we can, you know, mass on live stream. I know some families, they've kind of created like a little, like a mini altar, sort of. I mean, in the sense that they'll have like the the Bible and uh, maybe some icons of saints or something set up, you know, with some flowers near, you know, just as a way of kind of sanctifying a spot in the home uh, for prayer. Um, again, you know, trying to do as much as we can to to enter into the live stream. Um, so, I, so I, all those things I think would be great, and I would I would certainly encourage that. Um, whatever whatever works for your family. Um, but yeah, if, if so, if you have some bells at home, and that's a way to I'd definitely encourage that. So. I think yeah, well, we, we could yell action as we start. <laughs> that, that might take us out of the moment, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> that's, that's right. Uh, let's see. The, the work of the Holy Spirit in the readings of these days seems unique and formidable. Do you see any, any parallels with what he is doing or wants to do in our time? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, so are there, you know, parallels? I, there, there's always going to be parallels in the scriptures uh, to what's going on in our own day. Um, that's why, you know, that's why we, you know, we say God's word is the living word, right? That it's, um, it's timeless. So yes, it was relevant for the people that it was, it was written by and written for thousands of years ago, hundred, uh, well, thousands of years ago. Um, and then, you know, hundreds of years ago that people lived in our time and in the future. Um, that's also a reason why, you know, uh, you know, not to get too far afield, but some people ask, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll get people ask me kind of like, well, you know, Father, do, are, you know, do you think we're living in the end times or is the end of days upon us? And, uh, you know, I always, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I kind of, not jokingly, it'd be kind of half jokingly say, well, yes, like we are living in the last days. Ever since uh, Jesus ascended to the Father, we're living in the last days, right? It's the, this is the age, this is the age of the Holy Spirit. And so um, we are living in, in the end times. Now, how proximate those end times are, it's a fantastic question. Jesus says in the book of Revelation, I'm coming soon. And soon from eternity's perspective, St. Uh, Peter, in the second letter of St. Peter, 
Um, he tells his readers, he says, don't forget this one fact, uh, or my brothers, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years are as one day. So depending on how you look at that, depending on what it's like from God's perspective, um, you know, Jesus ascended to the Father two, 2,000 years ago. Is that two days in the time of eternity? Uh, we, yeah, we don't, you know, it, it's, uh, we don't know in our time like how proximate the end times are. Um, but the signs that Jesus speaks about, wars, insurrections, earthquakes, all those things, um, plagues, those have been, you know, those have been going on since, again, since he ascended to the Father. So the point is then to always be ready, right? To always be ready to stand before the Lord, whether that's, the literal end times or whether that's, you know, the end times of our own life when our own life comes to an end. Um, and we're not meant to live in fear. And so, yes, I mean, certainly parallels in our own day, um, you know, to, you know, suffering, kind of like I mentioned the homily, you know, the different, even if it's not quite persecution to the level that, you know, the martyrs or St. Paul endured, but just all those sufferings that we're undergoing at this time, um, to offer those up in union with Christ, uh, not allowing our hearts to be troubled or afraid or operating out of fear, um, because of the times we find ourselves in, is a great antidote. Reading church history is a great antidote to, to that, um, to kind of the discouragement or thinking how bad things are in our own day. Um, you know, just in terms of like dealing with the plague, um, I was thinking, you know, the, the Black Death, which, you know, was uh, what, almost a thousand years or so ago, maybe a little bit less than that. Um, about a quarter of the population of Europe died. Right. I mean, so you want to talk, and, and a lot of them at that time thought that it was a sign of the end times. And I would say they had a bit more of a reason to think it was than us. So, I mean, you want to talk about a plague of literally biblical proportions where in the book of Revelation, there's a part where it talks about a quarter of the, um, I think it talks about a quarter of the population dying. I'd have to look, look it up exactly. But, um, and then you have that happening right in, in Europe with the, uh, with the Black Death. And so you could understand, we see why there are a lot of people back then that thought the end was near um, as they're seeing you know, so much death and devastation and yet the end didn't come. And so I think you know, keeping a perspective, um, if you read some church history too, that can help us you know, keep things in perspective about things the church has been through and things that we're going through. Um, you know, it's always e so easy for us to kind of keep things focused on the only, on our times that we're living in, because we're the ones living in them, um, but knowing that our brothers and sisters that have gone before us in faith have experienced similar things, and in some cases much worse things than we're experiencing now, I think is always helpful and, and gives us some encouragement uh, and openness to the Holy Spirit in these times. So hope, I hope that's helpful, but yes, I, I absolutely see... Um, you know, parallels between, uh, between what's going on in the, in the Gospels and, and the, the readings in, in our days now. Um, great question. Okay, I think, um, yeah, those are great questions, everyone. Thank you so much, and I think we hit them all. So, uh, great. Um, I, I hope you have a blessed rest of the day, and uh, I'll see you on Saturday. You're stuck with Father Joe for the next three days. So God bless you all. Take care. <laughs>